Hi there, welcome to Act on Mental Health. My name is Sean Hardy and I'm a licensed mental health counselor here in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Now on this channel, I teach some basic and advanced concepts from acceptance and commitment therapy, or ACT for short. And I also teach the science behind it, relational frame theory, or RFT. These therapeutic approaches have changed the way that I see therapy, my role as a therapist, and what works for clients. If you're a grad student or a recent graduate, or a new therapist, or just looking to learn more about ACT, you're in the right place. Metaphors are an important part of helping people to change. In the next few videos, we're going to learn how metaphors are used in ACT, as well as how they function in therapy. But first, let's cover two important questions for those that are new to ACT and RFT. What is ACT? ACT stands for Acceptance and Commitment Therapy. It's a form of psychotherapy that encourages us to embrace our inner life of thoughts, feelings, memories, and sensations rather than fighting them. Did you catch that metaphor of fighting? Well, we're often engaged in a tug of war fight with our inner life, so to speak, and it has implications on our outer life. Often in therapy, clients are coming to therapy expecting change, and they want us to do that. Now that's a lot of pressure. What ACT helps us with is to change through acceptance, letting go of the rope, so to speak. Now this frees clients to explore other ways of relating to their inner life with more distance and create what ACT aims for of psychological flexibility. ACT teaches us to move toward our values, making life more vibrant and fulfilling. And for therapists, it helps us keep our end of the bargain to help clients change. RFT stands for Relational Frame Theory, which is the science behind ACT. It explores through empirical research done by psychologists how language functions in therapy and in this change process. RFT proposes that language and how we come to understand the world around us and our place in it comes from relational frames. This framing influences our learning and how we respond to life's challenges. A pivotal figure in this field of research into RFT and ACT is someone named Nicholas Tornicki, whose books Learning RFT, The ABCs of Human Behavior, and Metaphors in Practice, and I'm almost done with that one, make up much of what I've learned about this kind of research. Metaphors in Practice will inform much of the videos in this series, and it breaks down the roles of metaphors, how they work in therapy, and how to create them on your own. Now this video is an introduction to metaphors, and hopefully by the end, you'll have a better idea of the roles of metaphors and why therapists use them so much. Now that we have a basic understanding of what is ACT and what is RFT, let's talk about metaphors and how these connect to the change process. Now, I want you to imagine that a plumber shows up to your house without any tools. Now, this plumber can only do the simplest of tasks, like turning on the water tap or pulling out a spoon from the garbage disposal. Anything more complicated? Out of the question. Similarly, therapists are kind of like this unprepared plumber. It's nearly impossible to tackle some of the complex concepts and issues that clients come with without leaning heavily on metaphors. Now these show up all the time. For example, I'm totally run down. Everything's going downhill. I'm just running round and round like a hamster on the wheel. I can't escape. My head just won't stop buzzing. It's like a wasp nest in there. I feel so empty. There's a huge hole inside. People often use vivid expressions to describe their feelings, both in everyday conversation and when they're talking about deeper emotional struggles. For example, it's pretty clear that no one is literally finding themselves running on a hamster wheel or has a bunch of bees or wasps buzzing around in their head. Yet we still use these kinds of sayings to talk about one thing in terms of another. This isn't just something that people in distress do, it's common across all sorts of conversations. Therapists too often speak in this way during a counseling session. In acceptance and commitment therapy, therapists intentionally use this style of talking. They might talk about thoughts, memories, and feelings and sensations as if they were passengers on a bus. They may compare unhelpful coping methods to digging yourself deeper into a hole when trying to escape it. And they may describe a good approach to life as 
remembering to take your keys with you. Metaphors connect with a client's daily experiences in ways that more technical descriptions of mental health symptoms and behaviors don't. It's the difference between getting a physical and getting checked out at a doctor's office and my spouse's tender touch at night. These two are not the same. Now, some of the key aspects to metaphors that we're gonna explore in this series are metaphors' source and target, conceptual metaphors, emotional metaphors, the three processes of metaphors that change, and how to create, catch, and co-create metaphors. For this introduction, we'll start with a metaphor's source and target. There are two basic parts to clinical metaphors that we need to better understand if we're going to use them effectively. The first part is the target, which is whatever the client presents as the issue for treatment. The second part is the source, which is whatever the therapist presents as phenomenologically the same as the clinical issue. Phenomenological refers to the objective and subjective parts of reality, what we both observe and what we experience. Let me provide an example from Pernicki of Barry. Barry, a retired truck driver, is dealing with chronic pain and depression. He has shared with his therapist that he stopped doing activities that he's once enjoyed and he wishes to return to. And this is a reoccurring theme in their discussion. Therapist, how did it go with calling your brother? Did you speak with him? Barry, no, I didn't get around to it. I'll do it another time. I was in so much pain last week that I couldn't be bothered. Therapist, okay, so you've simply parked. In this dialogue, the therapist uses the metaphor of Barry parking to describe his inaction, his decision not to call his brother as a way of illustrating his stagnation. This metaphor isn't chosen at random. It reflects a pattern of Barry's behavior where he often cites pain and depression as reasons for not doing things he aims to do. By choosing this metaphor, the therapist highlights a crucial aspect of Barry's challenges, pointing out how Barry's avoidant behavior is a significant part of the problem he faces. Now, Troniki lays out three principles to metaphor creation and change work. The first principle is this. The metaphor's target must be a phenomenon that has an important function for the individual client. In layman's terms, this basically means that we want to identify thoughts, feelings, sensations, and memories that the client experiences that result in unwanted behaviors. Now, this doesn't just apply to the target. We'll see in the second principle that it also applies to the choice of source. The metaphor's source must correspond to essential features of its target. What does all that mean? Well, the metaphor used must reflect the client's own experience. For Barry, hearing you simply park should immediately click as a fitting way to describe his avoidance of not calling his brother. Choosing the right metaphor requires knowing the client well, ensuring that they feel understood and heard. The metaphor park works well for Barry, who's a retired truck driver who's familiar with parking, making it relatable. But if a client has no driving experience, such a metaphor might miss the mark. The key is whether the metaphor makes sense to the client and aids the therapy process. The third principle of metaphor creation is that the metaphor source must contain a property or function that is more salient there than it is in the metaphor's target. This is the bite, so to speak, and it's what makes the metaphor stick in the client's mind. The therapist uses the metaphor of parking to highlight a key issue of Barry's behavior, avoiding actions like calling his brother. The metaphor suggests that just as parking halts progress in a journey, avoiding action prevents Barry from moving forward in his life. Now that the therapist has a fitting metaphor to capture Barry's experience, the therapist can switch back and forth between target and source and expand on the metaphor. Now this looks different for every client, but for Barry, this may be another session where he's in a different situation and this metaphor of parking can be brought in. So Barry may not be taking action toward a value like spending time with family. And so he may come to a session, he may be talking about an, a, an upcoming birthday party for his nephew and how he's in so much pain, he's so depressed that he doesn't know if he's gonna go. And so the therapist can say in response, Barry, I'm wondering if you're parking right now. This allows the client to sit with this source of parking and reflect on the target behavior of avoidance. He may agree further to clarify, well, I'm not parking, I'm reversing. 
This opens up a whole new function for the behavior that the therapist can then explore. And that's what we'll learn in the next video in this series on metaphors in ACT and RFT. This does it for our introduction to using metaphors in ACT and RFT. Next up, we'll learn about how to conduct a functional analysis so that we can get good targets for metaphors. And we'll discuss the three processes for change. If you like these kind of educational and interesting takes on ACT and RFT, feel free to like, share, and subscribe. By doing so, you're going to let YouTube know that you'd like to see more content like this, and it makes this content travel further to reach others than it could on its own. And this is going to travel to people who are learning ACT like you and me. As always, remember that your journey towards a more purposeful and mindful life begins with a single click.